You're listening to the Gym Boy Star Podcast, episode 90, titled Dragon Warrior for Life, part 2, guest starring Kenshin 1913. Welcome everyone, this is Jim Boy Star, it's the Jim Boy Star Podcast, and how is everyone doing today? Hopefully you're doing great. Uh, I have Pete for the second part of this Dragon Warrior 4 special. How are you doing, Pete? Doing great. And yourself? I'm doing fine, doing fine. Uh, so, let's get right into it. We we did chapter one last time. Actually, I have a question for you, and, and, and you don't have to answer it right now, because I don't even know if you'll know the answer but what's a gum pod i don't know what a gum pod is I, I i think it's probably just some useless item that they meant to have something happen with it but i i actually never found a use for it when i was playing uh it, the game either mm-hmm. all right so let's go let's get, let's get right into the story how was used to lead us off as always so chapter two starts. If you remember, chapter one ends. Ragnar is going to look for the legendary hero after saving the kids. And so chapter two starts off in a totally different area. And uh, you're, um, you you play as Princess Elena. And uh, she pretty much is like a tomboy princess who wants to go out into the world and, and um, explore and, and uh, prove her strength. But her king won't let her leave. So she, she talks to the various people in the... Uh, apparently they're fixing her wall and she talks to the various people in the castle. And that part is kind of tricky because it always takes forever for the person who's fixing the wall to fix the wall. And uh, you pretty much knock down the wall that this person fixed for you. Mm-hmm. And you leave the castle. Right. And, now, now let me ask you this. The mm-hmm. Remind me again, when did Dragon Warrior 4 come out uh dragon warrior 4 came out i believe in in 1990 okay i was just i was just curious because i was uh i don't know why like the the beginning of the story always reminded me like uh the ver- the very beginning of like the little mermaid mm-hmm. you know where oh you you can't go where you, you know the fa- the strict father i guess you would say and i was just curious right. how far uh, a way that was so it was it wasn't as if it was released to coincide with this all right so go ahead so uh as you walk over there's a town directly to the west of the castle which is named santim i forget what it's called in the uh, ds version uh but she in in the ds version you're pretty much uh as ragnar his chapter was located in like a Scottish kind of area, Ireland or something. I think it's Scottish, mm-hmm. a Scottish area. This place is more Russian. It's more of a Russian thing. So in the remake, they call those Zarina instead of Princess. So anywho, you go to the town and you're meet up by two two uh, two people who are in the castle. One of them is the uh, pretty much like the the chancellor or the priest or something like that, and his name is Christo. Mm-hmm. Or Kirill in the uh, in the uh, the remakes, and then Bor- uh, uh, Bray or Boria in the remakes, and he's an old man. He's kind of like the classic wizard guy. He was uh, he was pretty much the princess's tutor or whatnot, and so they decide to go on the journey with her you know, because they're like, you can't. She's not going to back down, so we're going to at least help you so you don't get hurt. Right. Inter- interesting dynamic about them is that Christo is actually secretly in love with Elena. And uh, throughout the throughout por- portions of the game, if you're playing on the um, on the remake version, uh, you'll, you'll get to do some party talk. And there's a lot of funny dialogue between them two and, and uh, Boria. Mm-hmm. So we go into town as uh, the princess is like, yeah, let's go do an adventure, try to prove myself. We... Uh, we learn about a town to the north. Again, I, I, I'm a little foggy with the names for the towns, at right. least in this section. And uh, you learn that you know there's a, there's there's some trouble up north towards uh, another town in the mountains. So what we end up doing is uh, the group ends up heading over there, and they find out that there's a monster there that is trying to like sac- uh, is trying to uh, you know destroy the village by taking all the young women. So. Elena and her crew decide, all right, we'll 
we'll defeat this guy and uh, save the town. So they they have to do it at night, I believe, and they have to get into like this thing. It's called a litter. Right. Which when I was when I was a kid, I had no idea what I was like a litter. Yeah, what the hell is a litter? I don't think and I then knew the, what a litter was either. Yeah, and then at one point, one of the guys was like, the priest was like, "Don't litter the litter in the litter," and 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 then one guy's like, "It's no time for jokes," and I was like. I never understood that although, at all. There'll be plenty of time for jokes on puns when the Dragon Warrior 4, re, the 3DS version came out. That exactly. was the one that was a little punny. A few things I'd like to, uh, to, to point out here. One is, so I guess the Royal Wizard is very expendable. Like, yeah, the old man Bray, yeah. Because he, the king's just like, no, he doesn't mind him leaving the kingdom. So I guess... Like and and also, what is Christo? Christo, I think he was called a chancellor in the uh, Dragon Warrior Four, but in this, I believe he's called just pretty much a priest in the uh, in the remake versions. So I'm wondering, uh, like, what, why? Like, I would think with that kind of class, why wouldn't he be able to bring people back to life? Well, eventually, Kirill is able to bring, uh, or Christo is able to bring people back to life. Uh, at that point, I mean, you're on level one, so you haven't learned oh, any really I thought, good spells I thought he yet. Does, I thought he doesn't even get revive. I, I, I'm I mistaken then. Yeah, no, Christo, uh, Christo he does learn revive oh, okay. way, way, way later. And also, I love Elena's world map music. Oh, yeah. That's one of my favorite themes of uh, of Dragon Warrior 4 is the uh, Elena overworld theme it's kind of like light and bubbly and it's just kind of fun and, and it really that's the song when i think of like going out on an adventure that's like the song i think about a lot of the times mm -hmm. so yeah so we're at um and by the way that did you say the name of the town or did you not the, uh i don't remember the name i can find out i think it's temp t-e-m-p-e -E. yes temp yes thank you yeah so we go to temp uh, or the uh, princess and her crew go to Temp, and they beat the monster and save the town, pretty much. Which let lends you to learn about another town. Um, I forget what the, again. I have to look this up. Sure. Because I I forget the uh, the town names. But uh, basically, then we head to another town where we hear about a princess uh, or someone impersonating uh, a princess, and. Uh, we find out that this princess and her quote unquote crew are just a bunch of actors and they get taken by thieves, or at least the princess does. And they want something called the arm, uh, amulet of transmutation or the arm armlet of transmutation or something like that. Mm -hmm. And we, and, and, uh, pretty much. So we had, uh, Elena and her crew have to go to a cave and collect that. And that item is actually very important, uh, for later, um, with, with uh, what goes on with uh, the the plot. Anyway, so we go, we get the item, we come back, and we save the print the uh, actor lady, and she's pretty much like, okay, I won't do that anymore. So right, the interesting, we, we the, don't see them again, right? Yeah, I don't think we ever see them again. But the interesting thing about um, uh, what is it? The chapter two is that like uh, everything that kind of makes you continue on the journey is heard through like word of mouth through each uh, village that you go to yeah that's true i never thought of it that way yeah so it's kind of neat on how they're like because you can kind of like uh sequence jump a little bit after this part like you don't have to actually go to that town which i believe was called fenor or yeah, Fren that frenner sounds, that sounds familiar yeah yeah and then um uh so it's kind of like it's kind of like uh you know, you don't have to actually, uh, it's a little less linear than even the, f the first chapter, which is kind of neat. Mm -hmm. Now, my, so, do, do you think that, like, what would you rate the, as, as for this chapter, how, how, like the fighting? Like, is it, do you, do you think this is a harder chapter than one or a easier chapter than one? Uh, I think it's an easier chapter. I, actually, I think it's hard. It could, it's harder, but it, it like, has more strategy because, like with Ragnar, you're just kind of by yourself. You know, you're you know, all you have is really physical attacks, and and Healy will occasionally heal you up. But with this one, you get to control three characters, and 
if I didn't mention before, Elena, she's kind of the tomboy. She's kind of like a fighter mm-hmm. in the essence of she's better. Um, she she gets really high attack power and really high agility. So she can uh, do a lot of good criticals, too. Then, and then uh, Christo, he pretty much is, uh, or Kirill, he pretty much is uh, like in the road, like in the middle. It's almost like if you were playing Dragon Warrior 2 all over again. Because Christo is kind of in the middle, he's kind of strong, but you know he can't take a he can't take a whooping like right, like sure. uh, like Ragnar. And then you have uh, Bray, who pretty much is the wizard, the the pure mage of the group. So it's kind of interesting how there's more strategy to this because actually you run into even more enemies in this chapter than even in the first chapter. Mm-hmm. All right, so w- right now we're at. That, so we, we recovered the, uh, the well, we, we saved the fake princess. Right. And that, so where are we now? And after that, you kind of hear about there's like this bazaar in the south in the desert. So we head over there even past where the cave was at. And uh, there we actually, this is where the story starts to pick up pretty cool. You go there and uh, you're exploring the town. And at one point, one of the soldiers from... Uh, Zamoska, which is which I just looked up, is the name of the town in. Uh, but I think it's Santium. So, yeah, in, Santium in in the uh, in the Nintendo or the NES uh, version. I I love the so. I think it's every time you uh, you tell me the name of like you know what it is, what it becomes to what it was. I I have yet to hear one name that I'm like. Oh yeah, the new name is way better. I don't like any of yeah. the new names. I don't know why they. Well, why? Maybe I asked this before, but why did they change them? In fact, I'm almost uh, sure I asked this. Before. I don't know. Why, I'm not exactly sure why they changed them. I think, I think the reasoning why they might have done it like a big overhaul was because they were trying to make, you know, obviously certain towns sound a little more like Russian, at least for this chapter. So like every place is like a Z. Or a V and it ends with a V or something like that, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, it just—I guess it's just to kind of like um, make them seem like they're more part of the world if they were named like sort of Russian. I, I guess yeah, I, I'm yeah. not 100 percent sure. I'm not sure why they renamed like everything. But well, that, yeah, that's I, my ultimate question: is why did they remake, ev- change everything? Like I don't know why they. But anyway, that's just the, something that's gonna carry on through the rest of this mini series because right. it doesn't stop unfortunately yeah yeah every everything everything has changed or every all the names are different but it's still pretty much the same stuff yeah it's just a different name yeah and so um you head to the bazaar and you you meet up with one of the soldiers from elena's castle who pretty much says oh boy you're you know he's like you gotta hurry back to the castle because something happened to your father so at this point, you head back to the castle. And oh, by the way, you, you, forgot, the... you forgot to mention that the Desert Bazaar is also where you get the gum pod. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, yes. So in the Desert Bazaar, it's a really good area to fight and gain. That's probably some of the best gear that you can get in this chapter. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, you search through the pots, which is, a, I don't know if I mentioned this, is one of the new mecha- things in this game. I think you, you could search through the pots. Oh, Anywho, okay. and you get gum, and you get a gum pod. And uh, I, and I am not sure what it is. I think in the uh, the remakes, it's actually horse poop. So right, that's what that's what my research brought me to as well. Right, so they probably couldn't call it horse poop. But I actually found out that. If you use the horse poo in the in battle against monsters, I want to say it can either confuse them or make them run away. I forget exactly, but it does have a use, sort of. I mean, I mean, it's not even worth selling. You only get one for it. It's like right. ah, I might as well just throw it away. Well, I, to be honest with you, I don't. I want to know the person that was even paying one for that. Right? Yeah, I wouldn't pay one for that. Me I'd, I'd be like. I don't know, it's just weird. Like in Gumpod, like when I first played it, I was like, oh, this is going to be some sort of seed or something that we're going to need later. And right, it's like, yeah. nope, nothing. So we go back to the castle, 
that we find out that da- the dad is not able to speak, and uh, we we find a, a guy uh, in the castle because at that point, with the uh, one thing I forgot to mention when we rescued the fake princess, she gave us the thief's key, which we can use to go through most simple doors, which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. So we go and visit this old man who's at the castle who kind of tells us if we go and get birdsong nectar, we can actually uh, fix his, fix uh, uh, our dad's voice. So we travel up a tower, which is, uh, which is pretty much uh, west of, um, <clears throat> of the bazaar or east of the castle, whichever way you want to look at it. But uh, it's kind of cool because this, is the, this castle is kind of complicated. It's a, it's a little tricky, too, where mm. there's a lot of really dangerous monsters. But when we get to the top... We we learn that fairies make this bird song nectar and they leave and we're able to get it. So pretty much we go back to the castle, give our dad the uh, give our dad the uh, bird song nectar, and uh, his voice is fixed. And one thing we learn about uh, our father is that apparently he had the he uh, when he was a young man he he had like weird visions when he fell asleep he saw like visions into the future. And, like, he saw deadly stuff and all that. So he finally gives Elena, at this point, his blessing to go out into the world. Yeah, that's great, because how how far has she gone without his blessing? She went pretty far. She's pretty much traveled her whole whole continent. Yeah, the only thing that's stopping her from going anywhere else is she doesn't have a boat. Exactly. And there, there is one little shrine next to the bazaar where you can't, you can't go because the uh, soldier is there. He's like, oh, your father said you can't go into this place yet. So that's another spot that it's like, okay. So it kind of opens up that. So he kind of tells you to go and explore and test your metal and, and figure out how to become stronger and try to figure out what this, uh, like, darkness, because he kind of sees, like, this darkness coming by because that's how he kind of got, like, he lost his voice. It's like, I guess he was asleep, and he saw this dream of this, the 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 overlord of all monsters or whatever. And he got so afraid and he tried to tell someone something that he lost his voice pretty much. Right, so he's yeah, like, he, cause he kept seeing it over and over again. And then he lost his voice. He's cause he started telling, I think it was the council. Right. That, so yeah, he, that's, that's what led to all of that. Now it's just like, he's given, he's given the blessing. And you said that opens up this pathway that goes south. Right. 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 Yeah. And so we head to this shrine, which is like a warp, which is like a traveler's gate or warp zone or whatever. And we warp over this new area. Now, interestingly enough, if you stay at this place at night, you can actually see Ragnar from chapter one, yep. which is pretty cool. And uh, he's staying there and you can talk to him and he's pretty much saying, hey, I'm looking for I'm pretty much looking for a hero, a legendary hero. And, uh, you know, I'm from Berlin, blah, blah, blah. So we travel to Endor, which is probably one of the only places that ha- is the same name as it was in the original, which is kind of cool. Oh, yeah, that's and, true. I didn't even realize that. Yeah, and pretty much Endor is is like the hub of the world. Oh, yeah. And the, and the essence of every chapter after this is pretty much going to take place or take part in Endor in some way or, or another. Mm. So we find out that the we go to Endor, they have a coliseum. They have a casino. They have all kinds of shops. This place is hopping. This place is really cool. And we find out that there's a, there's an, a tournament going on for the hand of the princess of Endor. Now, the king realizes that he screwed up because he's like, oh, man, uh, I want my daughter to marry, but I don't want it at the expense of her marrying a jerk. So the princess begs Elena to enter the tournament because if she wins... She can. She can't possibly marry another woman. So, mm. so yeah, because she, Elena. Good. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I said I think that's very interesting because I guess this uh, kingdom, Endor, not a fan of same-sex marriages. I guess not. Not at this point. But <laughs> uh, but uh, so Elena is like, all right, we're going to enter the tournament. So at that point, we enter in a one-on-one tournament with. Elena versus five different uh, characters, one of them being uh, Vivian, which is like a bunny girl. And she actually is a reference in a lot of other games. If you, if you uh, check out, there's a couple interesting things there. 
And then we fight another really nasty battle called uh, with uh, with uh, 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 what the hell was the name of the Lee monster? Wire. It was something that had four, and you had to figure out which you had to hit one. Oh and his my name god! Was Linguar? Yeah, Linguar. Oh god, I hated that battle. So wait, before we go for, further with Linguar here, couple of things. So first off, why? Because because you you do hear about Necrosaro and him wanting to win. Um, mm-hmm. So why does Necrosaro want to win this tournament? What is in it for him? Um, I think uh, honestly, I think it's just kind of. I think yeah, you you hear about this really powerful dude, and uh, I think the only reason why he wanted to win was to just show off how powerful he was. Uh, you okay. know, because he's he's like uh, he's like an egg. Igna- um, what's the word? Igna- Emnatic or something like that. He's oh, enigma- he's, enigmatic. Yes, he's like that type of person where he's kind of like he's kind of like in the shadows and he's really powerful and he just wants. I think he just wanted to show off his power at mm. this point. And so he was pretty much the fifth match Elena had to fight. Right. Going up to that point. And now, um, th- this this is such a weird formatted tournament to me. I don't understand it. Whoever created it. Right. Because. Let, d- d- read down again. Re- repeat what you, what the format of this tournament again, just so people can get a grasp of of how this tournament works. Right. So uh, it pretty much was a one on one battle, and whoever won five in a row would fight uh, the other person who won five in a row. So. Um... So my question. So let's say you fought. You you got to the third person. And you lost. Now, does that third person, do they get a win because then they start at one and then they would have to fight four more times? Is that how that works? I guess, I guess that's how it would work. Um, like, I, I guess they only had so many people and you, you had to fight so many rounds and then whoever was on the top of that. I mean, maybe the five people that she fought or the four people that she fought. No, it was five. The five people that she fought ended up having to fight five people themselves, and that's why they were there. Oh, but, see that, that see that that sells it more logically for me. Yeah, what, it just seems weird that she automatically is like, oh, you know, her, and then she's got to fight. Yeah, it was kind of odd that she just kind of like jumped through. Uh, she kind of like fast tracked her way to the end. You know what I mean? Right. Also, Vivian being in the tournament is very confusing to me since why didn't she like i would think that she, that the king would have talked to her as well is mm-hmm. what i'm saying because it even if elena didn't win or didn't even let's say elena didn't even show up let's say nothing happened in santine castle and she's still there vivian would be the one that I guess he would be rooting for because again, Endor against same sex marriages. Right, right. Yeah, I think I think the thing about Vivian was, or at least why the reason why he probably had Elena like try maybe was because he heard about like her strength and her journeys and all that, and he was like, "You're the only person who could probably win this whole thing." You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I that's, also that's maybe what I'm thinking. I also like that. And, and here's where we're back at Linguar here. That mm-hmm. Endor's king seems to be more for interspecies relationships than same-sex marriages. Yeah, it seems weird that he's in the he's even in the tournament as like a as like someone who would marry his uh, daughter. Right. Because imagine if he won the whole <laughs> thing, that would be crazy. <laughs> it would. That's what I'm saying. This king. Is really messed up in the head. Mm-hmm. For what he's for and what he's against. Yeah. More for what he's for and having interspecies relationships. Yeah, exactly. It just seems odd that that there was even a monster that was able to enter because there there should have been a rule there like, okay, whoever wins this thing is going to marry the princess. Uh, no, no, uh, no monsters. Because I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna let my daughter marry a monster. How would the monster even enter? 
Because, like, I would think that you'd have to say, yeah, you, like, you probably, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, when you, as as you played, you talk to someone, and they say, would you like to enter this tournament, and you say yes. Right. A monster can't say yes, I don't think. No, I don't think so. The only thing I could think of at that point was if someone entered, someone entered the monster in as them or something. You know what I mean? Like, right. like, oh, I own this guy. He's going to be my fighter. Let him in. Mm-hmm. Maybe that was maybe that was the the case there. Maybe it, it does seem weird that they they would even let the monster even if they even if they. Uh, they're like, like, so, like, let's say it's an old man. And he's like, okay, this this guy is gonna fight for me, and they're like, no, we can't have monsters. They're then like, no monsters. Right. You would think that that's yeah. like a base rule. It's like that. Like, if there's one rule, there, that should have been it. Like exactly. All right. So let's so, so you beat Linguar. Yeah, and then after that, you are, um. Yeah, anyway, so it's one-on-one, and after that, you are uh, ready to fight uh, Necro Sorrow, or Sorrow the Manslayer, as they call him in the uh, the remake versions. So, he seems like he's going to be one tough cookie, and uh, he pretty much is making you wait, and you're waiting, and you're waiting, and you're waiting, and finally the king is like, go find him. He tells the soldiers down there, and they go back there, and he's not there. So that sort of makes you the default winner of the tournament. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of odd that Sorrow didn't even finish the tournament. I wonder if it was be- – see, that that is interesting, like, why he would just leave. Like, he probably has no intention of marrying her. Yeah. We, but I'm sure he I, – maybe he was just, like, and when we get to And when we get to Chapter 5, we, we get an even more – theory on of course he's not gonna doesn't want to marry the princess of endor his heart right. belongs to someone else exactly and i like how this chapter kind of like because obviously there's a main story to the game i like how this chapter kind of like starts putting the seeds of what the main story might be a little bit in this in this game or like in this chapter like it's like okay these are things you might want to look out for you know what i mean yeah and so we win the cha- tournament, and uh, the princess is not going to marry Elena, which means she could pretty much marry whoever she, whoever she wants to. So what ends up happening is we leave the castle, and uh, suddenly a soldier from the castle once again runs up to the princess and says, hurry back to Santine, there's something going on. And then he disappears. Can we talk about this? Because I want to know... In the Dragon Quest world, how come some people just, they they die, but then some of them just fall over and disappear slash evaporate? Mm-hmm. I honestly think some, this guy did not die. I honestly think that um, something happened to the castle like a magical spell. Okay. Like that made the people who live there disappear hmm. because because I don't think that they died because I want to say at the end of the game, spoiler, okay. they're back. They're okay. back. All right. I think after we do something, a certain something, the people of the castle eventually return. So you think they were so, just isolated somewhere, even if that, if that somewhere is in like, you know, um, I was going to say purgatory, but that's not really a great word to use for that. Right. They're in some sort of purgatory area, yeah. you know? Yeah. I, I, yeah. Because cause when I'm happening is you go, you're like, oh boy, we should go back. We go back and we go in the castle and no one is there. You go, you go up to your room, up to the king's room, all over the place and no one is there. Not even, the only thing that is there is the cat I and mean, you can't reach the cat. Or maybe you can. I don't remember. But the cat is there. And that's all that yeah. really matters. Because they apparently didn't take the cat. So right. so pretty much you just leave the castle. And it's an interesting chapter that way. And uh, no one's there. And Elena and her friends are, are like, we got to figure out what the hell's going on. And uh, I think that, like I said, I think that the the um, they pretty much, whatever happened to the, the castle, 
those characters got like warped in a magic spell somewhere else. Mm. I don't think that they all uh, ended up getting killed. Although at this point, you might think that they might have been killed. Well, that's the weird like, thing. But before we we before I chime in on on the on Santine being abandoned now, I do want to mm-hmm. rewind a little bit here to uh, after you after you win by default. Uh, if you talk to the Princess of Endor after you win, she says something like. If Princess Elena was a man, and I'm like, wait a minute, does that mean that, you know, prin- the Princess of Endor, e- is she bi? Is she uh, bisexual? She, I don't know. The interesting thing about that comment is in the, I believe the iOS Android version, because there's no party talk for the DS version. Mm-hmm. If you talk to her, she says something similar to that, like, oh, you know. It's too bad you're not a man, blah, blah, blah. And then Elena says something to the contrary of like, uh, you know, it's or she might have said that where she's like, oh, maybe if I was a man, I would actually think about it. Or she's something like that where, where it gives the impression that maybe Elena is kind of maybe a lesbian. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Or something like that. I, I don't know. It Which kinda would like, suck for Christo. Yeah, it sucks for Christo <laughs> because as you go throughout the game, if this is a perfect example of party talking and it's and it's glory in this in this chapter is as you go to different areas you get to learn about Christo and Bray and Elena and stuff and it's really cool to hear what their reactions on certain things and how Christo's like, Oh, if only the Tsarina, blah 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 and uh like uh Boria's kind of like talking about how he's kinda of old he's like kinda of like Danny Glover from from Lethal Weapon where he's like, I'm being too old for this shit, you know? And uh and uh, it's it's really interesting. It's a really fun interaction between the three as they go through. So and uh, yeah. yeah, it's inter- It is interesting. So the one thing that I, so I think this is definitely for me of the first four chapters the best cliffhanger ending. Yes, with, with, I think so too. Because the thing is, what what makes it weird is Santim is abandoned, and there's no people, but also there's no music. No, no, there isn't. That's what makes it a little creepier, too. You know what I mean? But, well, it also makes it creepy because nothing is damaged. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, the the throne or anything. It's not as if... It's not as if it was Dragon Quest 2 and you go back to that castle and it's destroyed. Exactly. This castle is perfectly fine. It's just no one's there. Mm-hmm. Not even a little flame that would represent... Some, which might lead more to your point maybe no one died yeah because the flame had in the past represented a dead person mm-hmm. and who's, who can't move on i guess but mm-hmm. no this definitely had the best cliffhanger ending of the four in my opinion right and one other point that just got kind of go over which was i remember you mentioned it uh maybe not like in this conversation but sure. uh, through an email you're mentioning how like as you travel throughout uh, the world with uh, Lena and her crew, no one recognizes the princess. Yeah, which, thank you. Which is, which is kind of interesting in its own way, but it also kind of, I kind of equate it to like, if she was kind of like, she never got a chance to go outside. So maybe the people in the, in the, uh, I guess, what would you call it, a continent or a country or whatever, they never knew what she looked like, maybe. Yeah, but Elsa and Anna from Frozen also couldn't leave and everyone knew who they were. Right. Well, yeah, I guess, I guess. it's it's kind of interesting how like no one knew can you imagine who if she you, was. Can you imagine if no one in the in the United States knew who Michelle Obama was, I guess. I don't I don't now that I'm thinking about it, that's a horrible example. But uh like I don't know, I'm just trying to think of some place that has a a king that I know the princess of do you, do you well you know what michelle obama's actually not that bad of a thing because she's the first lady mm. and like if you know she's fairly she should be fairly recognizable to most people you know yeah, what i mean at least person. in the united states and if like she was just chilling around in my town or even in your town and you're like who the hell is that and then like later on you hear did you hear michelle obama was here you're like what right. really yeah, I'm oh. so glad that you brought this up again because I completely forgot about it. That I even right, said right, that. right. 
that's so it's just so weird that uh, I don't know. But so what are your overall thoughts on chapter two as we're about honestly, to head out? Honestly, I think that this chapter is probably the best one out of the first four because it's got the most uh, it pretty much has the most um, the most story. The battles are great. The music is. Even though the music is great in every in every chapter and all that, I think the music for specifically the uh, um, theme, the overworld theme, was really really good. And I really like these characters. And I think like like again, it was almost like playing mini Dragon Warrior two because mm-hmm. <laughs> because everybody had their own little role in this game. And uh, yeah, I think or at least in the chapter. And I think that um, I think if I had to rate this, this is probably my favorite one besides the last one, obviously. Right. And the story, again, was very good. It's kind of and it's pretty, again, simple. And it's kind of laying the seeds of what is to come in the fifth chapter. Mm -hmm. All right. No, I I really like this chapter. Uh, Again, I think the it really picks up when you start getting involved with the. with the King story and him having the dreams. And then you have the, as weird as it is, the tournament, it, you know, that makes things interesting as well. Uh, and yeah, like I said, best cliffhanger ending of the four. Uh, so as we wrap this up, get, let's get some plugs for you. Pete, God, where, where can people find you? People can find me at YouTube. Uh, you type in Kenshin 1913. You'll find me there. Uh, you can also check out my Twitter, which again, if you just type in Kenshin 1913, you can find my Twitter, my Facebook and, uh, the YouTube pretty much. All right. Very good. All right, everyone. We'll catch you next time for some more of this Dragon Warrior 4 mini series. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to the Jim Boy Star podcast. Please visit the website www.thatspodcasting.com where you can get the latest news on all of the latest upcoming episodes of this show and you could download the archives of previous episodes and don't forget to subscribe on iTunes and Stitcher for the latest episodes coming right to you right when they're released you can also follow me at www.twitter.com slash jimboystar this is my story and thank you for being a part of it please